Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achint. Indian strategic culture, something we we have been questioning and we have been trying to get answers about for some time now, since the standoff with China especially started. A lot of people are looking at what the Indian strategic future outlook, current outlook, and what was the past in terms of our strategic culture. To discuss this, I have with me Major General C. Money. He was commissioned into the Corps of Signals in 1982. after graduating through nda and ima he retired at the rank of a major general as i mentioned in july 2020 three tenures in the northeast and commanded an electronic warfare unit during operations parakram in jammu presently he is the vice president projects of zen technologies hyderabad so thank you so much for joining me today and i believe this is your subject of study uh that you 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 know you've done your phd in the indian strategic culture so it's something very interesting yeah thanks adi uh, firstly thanks for uh, uh, getting in touch with me and uh, uh before we start you know i would just like to uh, there is something which uh, during my study of indian uh, culture you know it's come out that uh, in the upanishads it starts with a very important uh, thing which is relevant to all of us it says uh, uh, you and i were in kv kendra vidyalaya okay when we used to go to school we had this kind of a thing in right like, uh, after the prayer before the prayer to start we had this sahana bhavatu sahana gunatu sahaviyam karvavai tejas vinava ditam astu ma vid vishavai it simply means that let us discuss with vigor and vitality let us not argue but let us have a a debate and let us mutually you know learn from each other that's what it means and i think that's a very good way to start when when you see in a country like ours we are being split into divisions nobody is willing to talk with the other so this is a way this is part of our culture i thought we should is a very appropriate way to start that what we discuss it is uh, i'm not a strategic expert i'm more of a i'll say a military historian uh, and that's what got me interested in the subject because when we were at school we used to have a look at uh, the textbooks and we have a concept of india it has got a shape you know and it is uh, it's got mountains to the north it's got the seas on all three sides a peninsula and beautifully formed but uh, when you look at the reality later on in life suddenly there is a shock that is not india there are large parts of it which are not part of the they are not part of the country at all then one start wondering what went wrong why is it that what we have been taught in the history books and what is reality is somewhat different so that got me interested in this whole thing that uh, then there are some schools of thought in international relations like there is the idealism school so uh, they say when your leaders are idealistic then they make decisions they look at humanity as whole they look at fair play justice morality and then it is expected that you know nations will follow that path this is the idealist school and most people feel nehru was you know this kind of idealist then we also have a school of the realism one that is realist school is you know it says a dog eat dog world and uh, you know, there's no justice or fair play it's a, it's a system is characterized by anarchy there's no world government as such nobody listens to the united nations so might is right whoever does right gets it then there's a constructivist constructivist school also which takes realism and links it to the processes uh, through which you know decisions are made but we find that in the indian case all the three uh, schools don't give us the answer that we seek so there is something more to our decision making so that is what got me interested in this subject that does india have a strategic culture as such is are there some decisions which can be explained by our culture by something which inherently it is indian is that an indian way of doing things so that's what got me interested in the subject interesting sir i think uh, you know history always plays a role in how a country looks forward and there's a good old saying that those who don't learn from the history are bound to repeat it so that's something uh, which you brought out very nicely in your answer so what exactly do you mean by strategic culture sir? because a lot of people use this word strategy strategic 
you know long term thinking and stuff like that what would you consider as a country strategic culture yeah i think it's a great question because uh, it is this is a term which is uh, loosely you know used strategic culture and uh, and actually the rigorous analysis into this actually started only in the 90s when there was a, a there was a scholar called uh, johnston so he gave the one who actually gave a uh, gave a kind of a theoretical framework for this whole thing called strategic culture historically it started sometime in the 1970s when uh, both the us and the ussr they had nuclear weapons and they found uh, that their approaches were different i mean both a similar both a country superpowers but the usa's concept uh, was that uh, nuclear weapons is a deterrent whereas the uh, soviets always plan on fighting a nuclear war and winning it so this entirely different approach of uh, you know uh, to a nuclear weapon or a nuclear arsenal so that was the one they said there's something more to this it can't be explained away by any any of the schools of thought so they said that means there is a difference in the culture of the soviets the soviets have had such experience in leningrad stalingrad massive casualties napoleon has come and uh, and uh, so has hitler they all been beaten back by the russian winter and uh, this thing you know the harsh terrain so and they are used to body bags whereas the us being isolated with oceans on all sides it's very it has never had an attack and homeland until line level so they possibly felt that this is why this cultures of uh, to body bag your response to a you know death is different that's why they said uh, soviets you know preferred uh, i mean they thought of how they could win a war and you know a nuclear war so that was the start point then people started working uh, around it then johnston finally got it down to three basic questions he says how does a nation the nation's leaders are there they are the elites the decision making elites how do they answer three basic questions the first question is what is the efficacy of force what is their answer to that how comfortable are they in employing force so that's the first question and the second question uh, they have to answer is is does war have any role to play in human affairs so this is the second belief how strongly do you believe that war is going to to play okay and the third belief third uh, question they have to ask they have to answer is is your neighborhood who are your adversaries and how do you deal with this what is the nature of the adversary okay so these are the three basic questions uh, which uh, is a if you answer these questions and the nation answer these questions this is a central paradigm from which all your strategic preferences flow so when a situation comes up based on your answers to these three questions you have strategic preferences and you will choose up uh, i give on so many options i i choose this for instance i remember that i attended once as a young major i gone for the army commanders conference and uh, i remember there was some discussion it was 1997 i think Uh, and then there was some discussion the chief was sitting there i had gone along with my army commander and uh, the and the chief said guys give me some uh, he says i want some solutions he says something happens there's a bomb blast happens and you and uh, the government asks me uh, you know give me an option i come back to you give me an option then you people tell me that let's go to war and i tell the government let's go to war the government says sorry you can't go to war so this is what are the other options so your is how you answer these questions and based on that you choose you make choices you have to you have to respond to your adversary so what are the choices you make now if there is a if you have a then you rank order the, these are the these are the situations of crisis which came up in the nation's past this is how we responded and you keep plotting them so when you do the rigor of research and analysis then you come to a conclusion okay this is transcended through so many years and this is how the our decision makers have responded so then i said okay now for my subject topic i chose four i chose that india has fought four wars after independence so i said let us see what led to those wars and then let us see how did our what are the decisions taken 
both in the political domain, the military domain, diplomatic domain, what are the kind of decisions we took? And is there any trend which comes out at the end of it? So then you can say, okay, India has got this kind of a strategic culture. And this is the conclusions one can arrive at. Once you consistently look at it, and India, like for in, uh, in our, my case, the first one was Nehru was the leader. The second war uh, in 1965, uh, we had Shastri, who was the leader. 71, we had Indira Gandhi, who was the leader. And in 99, we had Vajpayee. They transcended the complete political spectrum. Their thought processes were different. All of them were on different uh, you know, backgrounds. But surprisingly, the decisions they took most of the time followed a pattern. So that was my conclusion when I came to that. So by going through all these uh, the wars and uh, the actual research, so that was the kind of, uh, you know, uh, my hypothesis was validated when I found that there was a consistency in our approach. <clears throat> that is interesting, sir. But, you know, one thing that we note, um, and this is something that, that has been said today pretty much in the wide open public domain, that India's uh, likeness to use of force is not very, very, you know, we're not very, very coherent with the use of force. Probably one of the first times we actually taught somebody a lesson were these Balakor strikes and the surgical strikes that happened uh, in Myanmar and JNK as well. Uh, going after the enemy is something that we've not done. So how do you see this entire thing that India kind of resists itself from using force in a lot of the incidents that we see, especially pertaining to Pakistan? Yeah. See, the, like this is the first uh, paradigm, the, the first question of the paradigm. That is, what is the efficacy of force uh, that the decision makers believe in? Uh, so if you look at it, uh, India's approach has been, it has not done away with force altogether. It has been a very nuanced and a calibrated uh, approach. Even Nehru, for all his uh, peace-loving uh, you know, uh, attitude, even he was most of the time, he was quite uh, you know, okay with using force. Uh, in the sense, in 1950, it's, uh, the first time it happened was in Khulna, when there was a communal, uh, the same, mm. uh, communal riots in Khulna. And they were spreading out into India. And uh, Pakistan was not willing to control it. So he tried to get a, a dialogue going, but it didn't work out. So that was the time he deployed the army. And this was in 1950. You know, just newly independent nations. And he deployed the army in Punjab and he deployed uh, in also in uh, a division in West Bengal. And uh, Liaquat Ali Khan came, straight away came for talks after that. And that is when the refugee, pro you know, the, they took, uh, they agreed to share refugees. And uh, so various breakthroughs took place, like the enemy properties, how to deal with them. Like Jinnah's house is there in Bombay, you know, just still they. And so, so are our properties lying in uh, Pakistan. So that's kind of an arrangement came. The next time Nehru used force was in uh, 1951, uh, barely a year after that, when uh, he announced the assembly elections in uh, Jammu and Kashmir. So again, Pakistan re reacted violently. They moved a brigade to Raval Court. And it appeared that, you know, they want to again start that thing. So that is when he again deployed his divisions in Punjab. And uh, General Karepa went to the president uh, and told him, please let me go across the Bias. Because if somebody blows up the bridge, then my armored division is going to be stuck this side of the bridge, this side of the river. So uh, Nehru was reluctant, but con finally they convinced him and he said, okay, you cross the river, but be on, don't be, be far away from the border. So don't go close to the border. So but this was also done. So Nehru used that. So even a person like Nehru, he again, like Junagad uh, unification, force was used. Some people say that the forward policy he conceived in, uh, against the Chinese was also an example of using force. But uh, there is another alternate view that, that is that uh, when you look at uh, the blunder of the, for, uh, the, for, the forward policy was that you're using the army in a policing role. The army was told, go and man those unoccupied places, but they were not given the wherewithal to protect themselves. So somebody calls them and says, actually, uh, Nehru's concept was this, uh, they were satyagrahis 
but armed satyagrahis. The same freedom concept, he brought it back to the Chinese and he thought that our case is so strong, uh, our model, this thing is so strong, our desire for peace is so well known all over the world that we are a peace loving nation. Nobody will do anything to them. They are just occupying unoccupied areas. They will not fire first. And so he thought, that, you know, and just because of the moral force, nothing will happen. Nobody will do anything to them. So this was the forward policy. He conceived it in that manner. And for two to three years, it worked almost. Because actually, they were, not, they were it was, uh, the Chinese were very practical about it. They realized that these people are responding. So they just, you know, they filled up gaps, we filled up gaps. And then, uh, so the way they looked at it was, it was, they called it armed coexistence. We call it for forward policy. But the, the tragic mistake made at that point was uh, in the MacMahon line, uh, we established a post in Dola. That was uh, uh, by the Indian perception, it was on the, the side of the MacMahon line. Whereas the actual truth was that uh, it was actually north of the map marked MacMahon line. So that's why it is like a Greek tragedy. We didn't want to go to war, but it was forced on us because because it was uh, we didn't know that it was also the uh, this thing MacMahon line because the MacMahon line was on the principle of the watershed. So that was the principle on which the MacMahon line was made. So we all assumed that in the watershed there's a huge Thagla ridge on the other side of the Dola coast. They said the the boundary goes along the Thagla ridge. So they said uh, this is well within our side of the MacMahon line. But the actual truth was, uh, although, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of versions to it, but the actual truth was it was north of it, north of the Macmillan line. And the reason for it also, it's, it's there in a book by Claude, R.P. has written a book on the Macmillan line. And uh, the reason was Captain Trevor Bailey was a person who, who actually went across to Tibet, surveyed the en entire area and drew the Macmillan line. He actually drew it. Before the conference in 19, 1914, with the conference, the Shimla conference, which was held, before that, he was the one who actually did the ground rigging. But, you know, as you can say, it's a karmic thing that he fell in love with a girl, a Monpa girl in Tawang. And he, because of which, he didn't actually recce this part of the frontier. And just next to that is the Tibet, is the Bhutan. So it is very close to the Bhutan trijunction. This area where all this confusion took place. So he thought, as it is, Bhutan is so close by. So he said, this part, you know, in the last few kilometers, you hear tired of. You know, he said, so he stayed at the and drew it off the map. So that was one of the blunders which, uh, with the Chinese capitalized on, and uh, it led to all those consequences and so on. So, so even forward policy, if you look at it, uh, frankly, that. Uh, it was not conceived as a as using force as such. If it was to be conceived that way, it should have been done the way it was done now, the way we did it recently. It was done beautifully in the Pengongso Heights when you know they said, "Okay, you're you're doing something here," and we have the wherewithal to react. We reacted and we went and positioned ourselves in an empty place and said, "Okay, now you come, and now we'll take care." Whereas that kind of situation was not there at that point of time. In 1961, we didn't have the wherewithal. There were no roads, nothing. But this was the time we actually played it correctly, and that's how things are to some extent they have cooled down. So if you see that uh, overall, uh, you know, force uh, we have been very calibrated. When I when I look at 65 war, uh, every provocation of the of the Pakistanis, we just went a little ahead. They started run of catch, we didn't react to it. Very slow, small reaction. Then they came with the Gibraltar. Then once they came to Gibraltar and they uh, into, in, infiltrated into Kashmir and into Jammu region, then we captured Hajipir. We captured Hajipir, then he attacked Akhnur. And when Akhnur was almost lost, that was the time that we said, okay, Shastri gave the go ahead and let's go into Punjab. So at every step, it was like a, a person moving a chess board, uh, coins. So that you do this, I do that. You do this, I do that. And finally, it ended in the stalemate, finally. Nothing with disaster came out of 65 war. So again, very calibrated use of force. 71 again, uh, although uh, we achieved uh, you know, all success, but there again, the, our uh, objectives were not Dhaka initially. It was only that uh, General Sagat Singh, uh, you know, his uh, 
personal drive when he crossed the meghna river uh, you know it was his 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 task was actually to go up to the meghna but he went beyond the task he crossed the meghna he improvised a crossing uh, using all kind of resources air and he, he had just had few helicopters he used the edit island hopping and he went across that is when dhaka came into threat so to that extent also basically you know it, it was because sagar singh leadership that uh, 71 also you can say success in the east but again uh, we didn't get back haji peer uh, which was in the uh, in uh, kashmir and so on so that why so that so again the force and we restricted ourselves completely in the uh, the western theater we had amardev roaming around in trains but amardev never came off the tra- of the uh, this thing train never went into battle and there is a punch we have been you know we have been uh, saving up for and uh, if you come to 99 again the force was uh, completely uh, no uh, we didn't even cross the lc for whatever reasons so if you look at that our force has been very calibrated uh, the basic biggest advantage of this calibrated uh, use of force is all our insurgencies are kept under control it's very difficult you know if you consider that we have been in nights in the 50s we have been in the northeast and uh, uh, in kashmir now since uh, 1990 still it is the violence has been kept pegged down you see what has happened in iraq you see what has happened with the isis you see what's happened in afghanistan you know because the violence just shoots up because you the both sides are using everything possible using drones you're using predators you know using all kinds of weaponry you're throwing on whereas our nuanced uh, use of force has ensured that everything stays you know tamped and the government the state still functions it's a very important uh, aspect of indian uh, this thing even the pakistanis they use their own air force against uh, uh, against the pakistani taliban they use the air force they never used it in a you know this kind of a role so i think that way our force use of force is calibrated and i think it is good it's a good uh, thing yeah interesting sir but you know somewhere down the line i actually realize that we lose more on a negotiating table than we lose on the game of war uh, uh 62 was an example of i think in my opinion as an outsider negligence in terms of fighting the war itself and not letting the armed forces do what they were supposed to do um this was a series of events that's why it led it up to whatever it did but the tashkent agreement which a lot of people still date don't understand why did we give back parts of lahore and you know uh, haji peer and all that of course the shimla in 72 returning back 93000 soldiers we couldn't even finalize the enclaves with with uh, bangladesh and we couldn't even streamline the international border with pakistan um another example in the 50s when we agreed with the chinese on the tibet the least we could have you know done was ask them to formalize whatever border that was there so we i somewhere down the line there is a feeling that we are not able to negotiate our way through even in spite of the fact that we win a particular battle on the ground uh how would you see this uh, situation sir yeah uh, actually this uh... I agree with you. You know, to a great extent, uh, we are lost from the negotiating table. That again, I think it's part of our strategic culture. So that's what the conclusion that I could come to. Because this is the second part of the central paradigm. That what is the role of war? Does war have a role to play in human affairs? And what is the decision making like? Let's think about that. So that is where uh, generally uh, all our decision makers have felt that war has got no role to play. that is a kind of an article of faith nehru was a complete pacifist so he believed that there's no way that you know, war uh, like like i said he was okay with force but uh, there is he's, he's on record saying uh, immediately after independence uh, roy booker was the indian cnc so he had made a plan for uh, you know expansion of the army and he told nehru that this is my modernization plan for the army so what he did Uh, what nehru did he told him scrap the army he said the police are good enough said, our policy is non violence we have no enemies okay so that so that was his approach that he said army i don't need the army 
Of course, the background would be a lot of other issues too. That why he didn't uh, like the army, and uh, because of this association during the independence struggle and all that. But this was his approach that he felt army was not needed. So as a result, uh, all the other organizations came up: paramilitary forces, the, uh, the CRPF, the BSF, constabulary, armed constabulary. You go to a parade. I went to a parade in uh, Calcutta. You know, Republic Day Parade. I was amazed to see that after our contingent passed, contingent after contingent of civil uh, you know, police allowed to carry arms pass through. The amount of I, I, I lost track of the number of contingents of passing. That means all of them had been nurtured by the state for you know uh, as a on the policing role, but not as a not for the army as such, and probably as a counter to the army because they were scared. That the army will be a coup, will you know come into coup, will come to coup mode like the Pakistanis uh, did. So a basic thing he felt that war, that is any agreement which comes out of war, uh, they were uh, against it. So that's what happened after sixty two also. Actually, when Mao was asked, he said, "Why don't you go to war with India?" He says, "He says Nehru was not willing to negotiate because every time we talked of the uh, you know borders, he was talking of history." He was talking like uh, Nehru's approach was historically he thought we are correct. Historically we collected tax and revenue till uh, the attack the Johnson line, Johnson line, which is a, you know, a stated claim line. He says we have been collecting this thing. We are uh, we are a civilization state, and through through, uh, through ages, you now our activities have been going. On. And then uh, 1846 there was a treaty with Tibet also, uh, which we was uh, done by Gulab Singh. And uh, we had that. Uh, so even till that time, uh, we were, uh, you know, our kind of interaction and everything took place. So historically, he was convinced, and that historical case was made by uh, S. Gopal, who was, uh, you know, the son of uh, a president at that time, Radha Krishna. So his go, his, and because he was so convinced with that case historically, so he thought that we have a very strong case uh, for as far as the border is concerned with China. But he should have realized that. Uh, even in uh, he went to the UN, uh, even with the, the in Kashmir, the UN didn't agree with his case. We had a very strong case. Accession was there legally. We were very right what we did. But superpowers don't think in legal terms. They think in terms of what is of interest to them. So the United Kingdom had interest in Hong Kong. So and uh, so they uh, in this Chinese case. So they never supported India at that time. Even when uh, during the war, the Americans they accepted they accepted the Macon line, but the Ladakh uh, this thing uh, area they not accepted. So the the, the point is that uh, so when Mao said I want to knock him back to the negotiating table, so he launched an expedition, punitive expedition all across. He said at least now you come and talk, but never refused. So, because his whole point was that you change the status quo by force, then you are asking me to talk. So this is that is something which was against, which went against his grain. So uh, his basic that's why he said even if you win the war, but I am not going to negotiate. So that was his uh, thought process. Similarly, in '65, it was went the other way around because they said uh, it's like in Punjab, why you like you talked of Lahore? He said. Uh, Punjab, we give it back because he says we don't have a claim in Punjab. We are again we agree with the boundary. Okay, so so there was no question of any discussion. That it was just a give and take, you know, swap. But where we had a claim, we should not have given back. But Haji Pir was a big blunder because uh, Haji Pir is a prime infiltration route even today. It's beautifully located in between the Jammu region and the Kashmir Valley. So from there, I can branch out both sides and uh, getting Haji Pir back. It's going to be it's a very tough thing. So Bloody, the the point was that's why in '65 that was a blunder we made. But again, the basic belief was that this war doesn't solve things. '71 we had all the cards with us. So many things we could have done. But instead, uh, Haksar was the you know advisor to Indira Gandhi. He kept he was historically like this thing about the Treaty of Versailles. Treaty of Versailles, uh, it, it was after the World War One, and the Germans uh, 
uh, lo lots of people believe that the Germans went to World War II because the Treaty of Versailles was so lopsided and so unfair. And because there was rampant inflation in uh, Germany after the war. And uh, you know, people are going wheelbarrows uh, with uh, the German currency marks to you know, buy a loaf of bread. They had to carry a wheelbarrow. That was the state economy at Plunso Valley. So in that kind of a situation, a person like Hitler came up. And he roused the nationalism and World War II started. Mm -hmm. So that is, the, that is the thing of Treaty of Versailles. So this, uh, Huxer said, don't impose a Treaty of Versailles on them. Don't behave like that. So be generous. And But the, the irony is, the same person with whom we were generous was the same person in 1963 when... Uh, uh, the Americans and the uh, United Kingdom, they got after us after the 62 war. They said, you, both of you people now get together, you and India and Pakistan. And any concession which India gave to Pakistan in Kashmir, Bhutto said, don't you see that you're a defeated nation? Give me more concessions. So this was 63. And uh, in 71, we were uh, very generous to them. Again, I think the basic belief is that war does not solve anything. Similarly, in 99 also. 19 also, Vajpayee had uh, three options. What, once he saw the infiltration had come in, despite his Lahore peace process, uh, and uh, you know that uh, the, the pass to Lahore and that, that uh, Karachi agreement and everything, still uh, the infiltration took place. So he had three options again. He said, either you keep skirmishing till the winter comes, and you end, uh, hit a stalemate. Second is, you open up the war and you know go to Punjab, Rajasthan. And uh, you know, you open up the fronts. And the third option is go for diplomacy. So what did you choose? He again chose diplomacy only, because that has been the trend. And he's a, he, this was from a you know uh, you can say a right wing government uh, expected to be more firm on these matters. But they chose diplomacy for whatever reasons. Uh, the reasons I'll come later uh, if I have the, the time for it. That is basically the defense forces have been stopped. Even if you wanted to go to war, we were we didn't have the wherewithal for it. For the last seven, six to seven years, we had been uh, starved. The different budgets had been starved. In Kargil, we didn't have the surveillance equipment. We didn't have night fighting capability. Uh, we were short of about 300 tanks. We didn't have thousand, we, uh, over 1,000 artillery pieces we were short of. So there's no way we could actually go to war also. So ultimately, the decision chosen was that, that go for diplomacy and it worked. But... Uh, so again, the belief was that war should not change uh, this thing. Again, 2002, we had an option. After your parliament attack, we had an attack in Kaluchak also. Again, we massively deployed. One year, we are there. But at the end of it, we again came back. So uh, I think, uh, so my conclusion after all this uh, thing is that 2611 also, uh, you know, we didn't go to war. No, as far as that uh, uh, tactical things are concerned, strikes, like Uri and uh, all those strikes, uh, they are responses. Uh, they are, uh, you know, I, I'd say in the escalatory matrix, certain responses uh, is the, that is the strategy we are looking at. To, because I think basically there is a war avoidance uh, thing. There's nothing wrong or right. It is just an observation. One of the reasons I think we see our build up in terms of the military infrastructure that we see in front of us today, in terms of buying aircraft, buying drones, buying tanks, missiles, and rocket systems, air defense, and this and that. Probably, <clears throat> excuse me, probably is to, you know, meet up with the gaps that we've created over the past six to seven decades of ignorance of the Indian Armed Forces. Having said that, sir, our nuclear program was much older than the Chinese. Uh, the Chinese exploded their bomb in 64. We did it in 71. Uh, we made the first nuclear reactor in South, South and Southeast Asia. As a matter of fact, uh, there was nothing around in this place. We were the first ones to do it. But today, if you look at it, uh, or even at that time, if you look at it, that uh, the, the nuclear threat was always there on India. In the 80s, I know the Pakistanis had threatened India with a nuclear attack, even when they didn't have anything. Uh, we had the technology, we had the know-how, we, we had done a test. But somewhere down the line, we always look at uh, this whole paradigm that we cannot be you know, defending, but we need to develop first. And you also use this term called, called war avoidance. How would you like to explain this, sir? Yeah, so like I said, it is uh, related to that, the previous paradigm only. Uh, because your bluff is called, you know, you're willing to use force. But 
uh, if you're not willing to go the entire distance, uh, if you're not willing to go to war, then people are there to call you a bluff. And that's what has been happening to us all this time. Uh, they know that you know India is, uh, doesn't like war. They, they are aware of it. And it is, again, because of our priorities. Like you said correctly, in 1956, we got our Apsara nuclear reactor. Two years before China had one. Four years before Japan got a nuclear reactor. By the 60s, we had our uh, heavy water plant, you know, which is again required for this. In 1960, Homi Baba was told, uh, was asked, in, and Homi Baba, that was the time everything came together for India. He was, there was a uh, conference called Atoms for Peace. In that, he was a chair. Uh, Homi Baba was a chair internationally. And he was leading that organization. So we could have got anything done at that point of time. Since he was, and uh, there was a lot of goodwill for India also at that time. And that is the thing when, uh, so when Homi Baba became, uh, and uh, Nehru actually told him, uh, because the background to it was that industrial revolution, uh, we had missed out. So he said, we should not miss out on this next uh, potent thing for energy, nuclear energy, you know, which can be used for development. So Nehru's viewpoint was development. He said, nuclear energy, I need for power. So I need it for development. So that's why I said, uh, he he's told Homi Baba, go ahead and let us... And by 1960, we were in a position to make a nuclear weapon. By 1960. So, was, uh, during one of the conferences, somebody asked Homi Baba, he's on record, so how long will it take? I'll take a year. As you imagine, uh, if you had that bomb, if you had a nuclear weapon in 62, how would things have turned out? And instead, we, uh, we weaponized when? We did our first nuclear explosion in 1974. Weaponized in 1998. That's 24 years later. And now uh, we are, uh, just imagine the situation. Uh, now we are in a state that we are requesting China that please be, you know, uh, give us waiver in the nuclear supplies group. And uh, let us come to the, we are doing the nuclear have-nots. But whatever the, whichever way you look at it. Because at that point, we didn't take that plunge. So, again, the, the perspective they were, the reason they didn't do it, of course, is obvious. Because that in case we're done it, we would have got sanctions, we don't have got loans, the population was starving, people will say, are you crazy? You know, the, you, guys, you guys are developing nuclear weapons, but you, uh, your population doesn't have anything to eat. You're dependent on us for uh, food grains. Because the US was giving us food grains, PL-418, all was going on that time. So, so the point is that there is there are a lot of reasons for why we didn't weaponize, but it is an approach. That was our approach. The Chinese approach is totally different. They were behind us, but the moment they got an opportunity, 1964, they did it. They exploded their weapon, and then after that, okay, they said, okay, now we'll develop because now we are secure. You know, it's a it's a basic concept that how the thought process is there: development first and then security, or security first and then development. For them, to security first. For us, it is development first. So that is the reason uh, that our entire thing has been on this poverty elevation, getting technology, uh, getting capital. So that's how, uh, and because we feel that any war, you go for war, you are backed by what, uh, a few decades, your economy goes down. And so, so as a result, war avoidance is very much, I think, part of our strategy. Nothing right or wrong about it again, but it is just the way things are. Like this is, a, and it is, a, it is the way we look at the world also, and a, so it is the way it is. It's, you know, quite weird. I'd like to say this because uh, I think uh, somewhere down the line that the understanding of strategic values and uh, threats towards our existence in this part of the world has not been understood very clearly. Um, and that's something I take from the sentence that you said that we had the capabilities even in 1960 to protect ourselves. And if we had that weapon in 62, things would have been very, very different. I don't think the Chinese would be sitting on our border today. It is impossible for that to happen. Of course, uh, that required a little bit of a strategic output. Even today, with regard to China, the everybody talks about tactics more than you know, strategic values of a long-term plan of countering China. Everybody says, Kailash lelo dubara, ye kado, wo kado. Fair enough, you can take Kailash, get them off their song, they will enter somewhere else. So it's not going to solve the problem as per se. It will probably put a band-aid on a bullet wound and that's something that I would uh, put across. Uh, that just tells us that uh, there is no strategic thought process or a very lack of it within the the 
people as well as the political you know uh, leaders that have have been leading this country to till date uh, how does that affect the decision making process of uh, the government who's facing threats like this today sir yeah so i think it's a great question uh, again you know it's a question that uh, it motivated me to go for the study that do we lack that strategic thinking do we lack it so i think it is a combination of reasons the first thing was uh, before independence the british took care of it our leaders you know they were educated in britain but they were kept out of the strategic thing uh, especially uh, with regard to you know security the Brit- the indian army was also secluded it was put into cantonments it was used as a tool of imperial cons- conquest and the british you know they just said you leave this part to us we take care of uh, the great game they played the great game with russia in afghanistan the central asian republics and uh, they established they kept china away they established nepal bhutan sikkim all those protectorates along the himalayas so there's a trip wire so china cannot dare to come inside and tibet itself was a huge uh, so they actually they took over the responsibility and there's no doubt that we lacked that uh, the initial leadership lacked that kind of a thought process and uh, there's a basic uh, and one of the flaws was they didn't involve the army also the first thing one of the first thing they did was take out the cnc from his order of precedence so that uh, because they didn't want him to be part of the, the high table it is still there i mean uh, that is a separate i think i can have a separate uh, talk on that different talks on you know the civil military uh, thing how systematically it has been downgraded and all that so but so you're not putting the military both actual people are going to suffer if some things goes wrong they're not part of the high table they're not part of the decision making process so uh, and if you look at it uh, neither did they have the inclination uh, nor were they uh, you know they really concerned either it was only when uh, when all these threats and all started coming up but if you look at it uh, say the national security council uh, which actually came up in 1989 uh, when bp singh government you know till 89 it was uh, we had a very muscular policy we had rajiv uh, rajiv gandhi we had uh, arun singh minister of state for defense and then we had uh, sundar ji all three i think they were all doom school types they were all you know gung ho that we'll tackle things we went to sri lanka and you know everything all those things happened but then 89 but still it was all like uh, kind of crossetted strategic decision making uh, whereas uh, formalized one national security council came up only in 89 but even then that never met bp singh installed it he had some very important reforms for defense also uh, which was like established the uh, integrated financial advisors at the command headquarters so the defense procurement becomes slightly easier so some very important reforms he brought in but national security council itself never met the kashmir problem was going on the punjab problem was going on uh, the us was pressurizing pressurizing you on cdbt and uh, nuclear uh, npt but nekris the security council never met it was only in 98 after we exploded the nuclear device that the security council was uh, again revived by bajpi and uh, because he said oh now you have strategic weapons i mean somebody has to tell you what to do then okay so so when you finally had it you know or, or we had it but you disclosed it at that point of time so now it is just not having a bomb or device i mean somebody has to deliver it somebody has to plan where it is to be delivered how it is to be delivered when is it to be delivered so there has to be a lot of strategic thinking to that so that is the nsc started there and uh, it went along in fits and starts uh, 26 11 happened even then uh, you know the the person who did the kargil review committee uh, Mr. Subramanian, ten years after Kargil, he had written a beautiful report on the you know, Kargil Review Committee report that what all should happen in this thing, you know, national security, what all should happen. And he says nothing has happened. Ten years later, when he says he says we couldn't make out who's in charge. Suddenly we saw black hat, we saw marine commandos, uh, we saw you know the army roaming out there. But who was in charge? That so that uh, that was what was uh, you know. That's so uh, so he said that his his observation is formal formal observation record is there that says uh, most of the things that suggested has not happened so what did he suggest he said let us have a uh, chief of defense staff who coordinates let's have integrated uh, you know uh, theater commands 
let's have a national security council national uh, security advisor who is not double tasked but british mr was double tasked he was also uh, you know secretary to watch and then also he was also the nsa so he says double because that means he is planning and implementing you can't do both there has to be some person who plans and some person who implements similarly for the armed forces also presently the chief is doing planning and implementing because the day to day things will always overcome plans we are seen in you know whether we are working in say corporate sector or whatever day to day operations will always overtake whatever long term plans you made so because if a person is given both then he the compromises will take place that's why uh, the chief of defense staff which was uh, january 2020 it came is a huge step and i think it's a very very positive step that uh, that has been taken similarly the national security council presently uh, the way it is functioning it's, it's, i think it's brilliant i mean it has uh, kept the pressure on is the persons there are completely hands on they have sufficient military advisors i have briefed uh, i gone to this national security council uh, briefed them a couple of times uh, after my trips to tibet twice so i came back and uh, briefed them on that and i find uh, it is all uh, and we have a national cyber security coordinator also there Uh, and so that strategic thinking is there but at the same time uh, uh, i would say that uh, you know despite all that uh, we suddenly read an article i'm out of this you know power uh, powers that be i'm on long there but uh, i read somewhere that isro is uh, going for oppo for the navic messaging service you know this is very short cycled on one hand you you know you on tiktok you're not your your ban the apps Uh, but then, uh, if Israel is doing this, I don't know why uh, it's being uh, why it's happening that way. So, Navic uh, that that your uh, it's going to be there in all your uh, you know uh, in all your weapon systems. That's all because we want to get away from the GPS. That's why we're going for that. So these are the things which uh, we have to you know look at. Uh, I'm sure the corrective actions would be taken by uh, you know the concerned people. But these are the issues. So uh, so strategic thinking. Uh, firstly, like. that is the third paradigm which we come to is that you know that uh, the nature of the adversity i don't think uh, we have really uh, pakistan more or less we understood but i don't think we understood the uh, northern adversity so well you know but that we really need to uh, go full fledged if you want to increase what you said to improve the quality of strategic uh, you know culture in our country Uh, we have to act, firstly accept that he is your adversary, and uh, the way he approaches things, we have to we have to take note of that. For instance, uh, there is a concept of face. You know, they have that concept that they can't lose face. That is very important to them. There is nothing called a good loser in China. It is only a good winner. Okay, and the the point is that you can't lose face. So the their approach to boundary negotiations, even with Burma, where they accepted the Macmillan line, was. the first that they will change the status quo they will use force to change the status quo then from position of power they'll negotiate and then then they'll concede more than expected that is the thing whereas uh, like uh, nehru could not take it that they had used force for changing the status quo that's why he's not willing to negotiate at all so that is the need that is that is the basic psych there the second thing is like india like chess was invented in india and the similar there's a game called go in china Uh, so uh, the basic approach is different in Ch- in chess you want to knock down the other guy you want to capture his king whereas in go uh, there are there is it is a contest and there's no capture as such it is just moving of pieces and at the end of the game it is who has got the maximum territory it, it is quite possible that you go in different places and at a certain critical point you may just go position your stone there you know so the way that game is played is a totally it's a totally different way the game is played and that is exactly what china is playing with us it is deep into the site that they'll keep moving these pieces and they'll wait for you to react so we have to get uh, so i'm uh, what i feel is that we have to really get to grips uh, with our adversary you know they don't even consider us as, as their adversary that that is another part of it because for them uh, it is all us and uh, for pakistan is all india you see national security policy i think came out yesterday in the open domain from pakistan all this mention is of india it shows how obsessed he is with india now if i if i issue a national security policy uh, then i have to be careful you know what i put down there and so similarly we have to take note that china is your adversary 
So we have to take a note of that and we have to plan accordingly. We have to prepare for ourselves. Because they got 50,000 characters. You know, we don't even know what they're speaking most of the time. And it's a very practical problem when you're looking at intelligence collections, uh, when you're looking at, you know, this thing. It's very, very, very tough to uh, this thing. So these are the things we need to firstly recognize they are the adversary and next we have to accordingly prepare ourselves for it. That's interesting, sir. So just to close, uh, request you to give us a you know short closing comment about uh, what you'd like to see happening in the whole study of strategic culture and the enacting of it. Yeah. Uh, I think. I think. Firstly, it is a uh, it's a narrative. You know, it's it's all play of narratives. We need a new narrative. Like I said, it is our, our value systems, our culture, which because of which we've taken so many de certain decisions in the past. It is how we look at ourselves. So we need to change uh, the narrative. You look at, uh, say, you look at the Western media perception of us. Then you will think that we have been fudging our figures. Even today I was saying that, that COVID-19, they're not willing to accept that we have done a good job. We've done a damn good job in controlling it with our population, with our kind of infrastructure, we have healthcare. But there will be nobody who is going to give you credit for that. But neither should you expect it. Because it is, it's, it is a narrative which is played out in the Western media. And there is a narrative which is being played out, uh, say, even by China or Pakistan. So that, so what we need is, I think, a very good narrative for us. We have to change the narrative. The present government, I think, is doing a great job of changing this narrative, how we look at us. You can't take everything and say, okay, this is Hindutva and this is that. No, that the first start point is that you do you have pride. Do you believe that you're, you're, you got it to be a superpower? Do you believe that? Do you strongly believe it? That's the start point. If you think, no, no, I'm not a superpower, you know, I'm okay with the way things are, I'm content, then you'll remain that way. We don't even we say we're on a reading power. We don't even say regional power because China's sitting on top of us. We don't. So... Firstly, we need to get a narrative for ourselves. What is the narrative? And uh, so that uh, so it is that war of narratives is very important. Next is uh, we have to be conscious that we are a civilization state. Uh, you know, a civilization state uh, means that there are, like we have a, a huge uh, population. We have a huge expanse of uh, territory. We have a unique uh, culture. We have unique traditions, and uh, we have a unique economy. We have a unique society. Why do people, why, why is India so attractive? Why does India have so far? It's because of this, that, that there is something good uh, good there in us. And all the narratives with the West is building or uh, our adversities are building, it is to destroy what you cherish. Like I saw during the toolkit thing which came out during the farmer protests. So yoga and chai. This is India is the destination of yoga and chai. Let's destroy that. So, so that, this is the narrative which are playing out, and we must be conscious of it. And uh, if you really want to get grips, you know, okay, uh, our, this is our approach to war, to force, fine. But let us look at the future. The future is artificial intelligence. Mm. The future is cyber warfare. The future is, you know, we have to quantum computing. I've gone to a startup in Bangalore, a brilliant work they're doing in quantum computing. And I think uh, in quantum key distribution, it's going to help us because once, uh, see, ultimately, nations uh, like war is more or less passe you now. You're not going to go to war. Suppose uh, that's how the strategic support force which the Chinese have created, they have recognized that. They put cyber together, they put space uh, along with it, they put electronic warfare together. Because what do you do when you attack a country? First thing is, you're not going to launch air force. Now, you first thing you're going to launch a cyber attack. You're going to get his power grid down, you're going to get his banking down. And then, uh, then you'll say you're going to okay. If, if his dams are also controlled, then you're going to get that down. It is something like you know, die hard four. That's what is going to happen. Your traffic lights will stop working. Your ATMs will stop functioning. There will be chaos in the country. So that is when the cyber attack will take place. So once it, once the cyber attack happens, then what? What is next? Then we close down our borders. Okay. Then what happens? Then the electronic warfare part comes in. The electronic warfare okay takes off. He's closing down. So you take the radiating media. The electronic warfare part comes in. So to, then the next step is uh, that, that the electronic warfare part also is over. Then next step is space. 
So from space, you uh, you know you use your uh, this thing. It's the same communication system goes to space and so on. So that is what is the the future is there, and we have to be we have to come to grips with it. And like I'm sure not make the same mistake. Like I said, the Pakistanis are talking of India all the time, but they are they are damn good at asymmetric warfare. So we should look at that. Let us look at asymmetric. Look at what Iran did. The, I think there was a brilliant response when Suleimani was killed. Uh, you know, uh, they thought there's going there's going to be war because when that uh, Iranian uh, general was killed. But they, their response was brilliant. They just targeted two empty buildings in the U.S. air base. They just targeted that, and those two empty buildings were demolished using technology worth few hundred dollars only. See, that is that is what they said, and immediately U.S. backed off. It was it was a demonstration that using such basic technology, we can have such good effects. That is what I think we should be looking at. We should harness technology. We have to go there, and we have to get away from uh, because, uh, like, if war is not an option, fine. But we must realize it is a contest, and the contest has to be fought, and we have to find ways and means of fighting. Absolutely, I think it's 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 long term coming for India to kind of open its wings and start flying in the region and. uh i agree with you one of the biggest things that we need to realize is china is our adversary and it's working probably over time to overcome uh our uh, you know national goals of having our influence within the region and across the world so thanks so much i think you've done very intrinsic research into this subject which shows with the way that you've given the answers uh to the various questions china of course is my personal interest of study um because there is a new development within china that affects us or even not it is a power in the region that we need to keep a tab on we need to study and understand and of course the 15000 characters are not a helping hand by uh, during uh, you know while doing the study of china it's a difficult thing to do uh, but having said that i think as a as a community as much as we like to talk about pakistan there also has to be a culture coming up where we are talking about our main adversary the big daddy which is the chinese thank you so much sir once again for uh, sparing this this time to take me through the journey of indian strategic culture till next time sir for another subject on dev talks jai hind thanks sir thanks sir